One day, while riding on a train, Pablo Picasso found himself confronted by an unorthodox, yet petulant critic. After Picasso sat down at his cabin, he struck up a conversation with the man next to him. A uh, working-class fellow, Picasso's companion, immediately began expressing great umbrage when he realized the man next to him was the pioneer of Cubism and largely considered to be the greatest artist alive at the time. The man launched into a tirade about how it's a sham and it's a fraud, causing Picasso considerable confusion. What's, what's a sham? What's a fraud? Modern art, the man explained. I don't get it. I don't understand it. Why do you people have to distort everything? Why can't you just paint reality the way it is? His criticisms rather succinctly captured many people's problems with the avant-garde nature of art since the 19th century. Picasso, however, was perplexed by the man's objections. How should I be painting? I mean, what does reality actually look like? The man contemplated this question for a moment, then reached into his pocket and withdrew his billfold, extracting from it a small wallet-sized photograph and handing it to Picasso. That's my wife, the man proclaimed. That's what she looks like in reality. Picasso took the picture with considerable apprehension in his face. He turned the picture over and looked at it from various sides and angles, and finally Picasso looked up at the man and met his eyes and said, Sir, your wife is awfully small and rather flat. And that man's name was Nicotine Two. Okay, okay, yeah, no, just joking about that last part. Now, that's a story that I recently published in uh, the Tuesday Mail in my column, A Moment in Intellectual History. I've mentioned that before, link in the crotch bar if you haven't already signed up. And like I said in that column, there's a very good chance that that story is apocryphal. There seems to be no mention of it anywhere in any of the numerous biographies on Picasso, and while the story shows up in tons of books about art and inspiration and creativity, I've never been able to find an original source cited for it. But to complain that the story isn't accurate is to sort of miss the whole point of the story. It's to be like the man on the train, thinking that if a work doesn't mirror reality in some supposedly objective way, then it's a sham or a fraud. And that brings me back to, to Nicotine, too. Uh, he has proclaimed that substantial portions of modern art are, in his words, a scam. His complaints are numerous, but seem to principally be focused around the idea that there is no talent required to produce modern art. He makes passing dismissive gestures at the pseudo-philosophy that attempts to justify modern art, but he doesn't mention a single detail about any of what those actual arguments consist of. I gotta say I was extremely disappointed by Nick's position on this, and even more disappointed when Tool Time seemed to echo his sentiments. I think both of these guys are great thinkers. I enjoy their channels a lot, but their videos on modern art, well, they seem not only to announce their own ignorance, but to actually take pride in their ignorance. I say that because I recognize the attitude. That's what I used to think about modern art. But that changed when I actually studied art history, modern art, and aesthetics. I got the impression from Nick that the only thing he's ever actually read about modern art was the placards in the museums next to the pieces. Please correct me on that if I'm wrong, Nick, but frankly, that's, what, that's how it appears in your video. I find that to be the equivalent of someone walking through, say, a natural history museum, reading the placards there, and feeling qualified enough to voice a thoughtful opinion on evolution. The notion that art should be something you can just look at and appreciate without having to think about, without having to understand the context or the history behind it, well, that's just painfully naive. I don't have either the expertise or the time to give a full rundown on aesthetic theory behind modern art, but I did at least want to throw a few thoughts in there to hopefully broaden people's minds a little bit. So first off, the guy on the train. His idea of art, that art must mirror reality, is called the mimetic theory of art, and that dates back at least as far as Plato. There were hints of this objection in Nick's first video. He complained about modern art not being representational, but he also says that he likes Picasso and Dali, so that's clearly not at the heart of his complaint. But what he doesn't seem to realize is the exact same criticisms that he's given towards modern art were given, and in some circles continue to be given, towards Picasso and Dali. 
And the reason why is because they violate the mimetic theory of art. Their works don't look like what their critics perceived, preconceived notion of reality is. But of course, that's sort of what makes their work so great. They challenge our preconceived notions of reality. They make us look at the world and ourselves in a different way. There's value in that, and we should embrace the works of Picasso and Dali for that reason. Mimetic theory be damned. Like I said above, uh, Nick's principal complaint seems to be that modern art takes no real talent. And one baffling example he cites of this is Jackson Pollock. He seems to be under the impression that you know, anyone could do what Pollock does. It's just dribbling paint on a canvas. I have a very simple response to that. Try it. I think you'll find it's a lot harder than it seems. Sure, it, it wouldn't be as hard as it would to, say, learn to recreate a painting in the style of Titian or Raphael. But if you think there's no skill involved in the mechanics of Pollock's work, you are sorely mistaken, Nick. But more to the point, why should we accept the claim that art should require skill? Consider this famous sketch by Picasso. The level of skill on display here is fairly low. It's a lot easier to produce something like this than it is to produce a Pollock. Should we say this doesn't qualify as art because it doesn't require much skill? Or consider photography. Now, I don't mean to suggest that photography as an art form doesn't involve a lot of skill. It certainly does. But many fantastic photographs have been taken by amateurs by simple point-and-click photography. Should we say that none of these photos count as art simply because they didn't require talent? Aha! You might be saying. But these are all examples of something that's beautiful. There's a great line in Ed Harris's biopic on Pollock. If people would just look at the paintings, I don't think they would have any trouble enjoying them. It's like looking at a bed of flowers. You don't tear your hair out over what it means. I have no idea if this was taken from something Pollock actually said or if it was fabricated for the movie, but it's a great line either way. But implicit in that line is the idea that art is supposed to be beautiful, pleasant to look at. But of course, the moment you say that, the exact same response we've seen to the mimetic theory and the skill theory represents itself. Why should art require this specific attribute? Once we put our mind to it, it's not hard to think of clear and unambiguous examples of art that violate this requirement. The word grotesque derives from a style of art that precisely tries to offend our sense of the beautiful. Should we reject the idea that these works qualify as art simply because they don't strike us as pleasant to look at? Quite the opposite. It's the fact that they are unpleasant to look at that is at least part of what makes them such great works of art. Well, maybe the issue with the kinds of modern art Nick has a problem with is the fact that it fails all of these criteria. It doesn't look like reality, nor does it require talent to create, nor is it pleasurable to look at. Probably the archetypal example of such art is Marcel Duchamp's Fountain. Fountain is exactly what it looks like. An upside-down urinal that he signed R. Mutt. That's it. It's non-representational, talentless, and ugly. It's also one of the most celebrated pieces of art of the 20th century. Now, I can't give a full philosophical defense of Fountain here. Whole books have been written attempting to do that. But I do think this plays nicely into Nick's straw man objection, shown here. Uh, this art is often justified as, as being revolutionary, or as expanding the definition of art. Once again, why is that even considered justification for it? Expanding the definition of art? I mean, I can call raccoon a bear, and I suppose that I have expanded the definition of bear, but I am not a genius for having done so. I hope by this point you can see the difference between redefining our concept of art and redefining our concept of bear, or any other mundane concept for that matter. There's no social norms surrounding bears, no philosophy of bears, no bear theory which attempts to tell people what qualifies as a bear and what does not qualify as a bear. This is because bear is a purely descriptive term. Art, by contrast, is a normative term. To describe something as art isn't just to say something about the thing, it's also to frame it in terms of certain expectations in the mind of the viewer. And from its inception, when we were drawing paintings on a cave wall 10,000 years ago, artists have been using those expectations in their construction and execution of their work. Sometimes they do this by abiding by and satisfying those expectations. But oftentimes they do so by challenging and frustrating those expectations. 
If all you see when you look at fountain is a urinal, then you do not see fountain. The work as a whole includes Duchamp's mockery and derision of people who, like Nick, insist on art only being certain things which meet their preconceived notion of art. It includes the deliberate provocation of our theories about what can and cannot qualify as art. It's the iconoclasm of Duchamp's fountain, when seen in its entire context, that makes it a great work of art. Now, I don't mean to defend all of modern art as such. But one great example of the failure of the aesthetic sensibilities of modern art was flagged by Paul Bloom in his recent book, How Pleasure Works. Quoting him directly, David Hensel submitted his sculpture, a laughing head called One Day Closer to Paradise, to an open submission contemporary art exhibition at the Royal Academy in London. He boxed it up with its plinth, a slate slab for the head to rest on. The judges thought these were two independent submissions, and they rejected the head, but accepted the plinth. Expert intuitions about history and performance are not always accurate. So, yeah, certainly there is a lot of pretentious, overrated crap out there, and I have no problem with people calling out specific works as such. But to do that, you have to actually understand and appreciate the specific work in its full and proper context. You cannot just dismiss an entire movement simply because it doesn't look like art. That's the whole damn point of the modern art movement. You don't get to say what is and what isn't art because you don't know. No one does. To paraphrase Arthur Danto, the defining characteristic of 20th century art is that it is mutated to the point where it is indistinguishable from the philosophy behind it. The veil between work and concept has fallen. This is challenging to a lot of people. But much in the same way that the works of Picasso and Dali challenge us, and make us look at the world and ourselves in a different way, the same is true of Duchamp, and John Cage, and de Kooning, and many other modern artists. There is value in such a challenge, in such a transformation if, that is, you're willing to try and understand it.